Let us begin right off the bat with vaccine effectiveness uh, postulated against Omicron. Are you ready? Here we go. In contrast, neutralizing antibody titers for individuals that were vaccinated with mRNA vaccines greater than four months ago will have waned about eightfold. It will now be so low for Omicron, 320-fold lower than recent vaccinees against wild type, putting them outside the range of our data. How far outside? Let us proceed. In indicating very substantial reductions in vaccine effectiveness for hospitalization and nearly zero protection against symptomatic disease and documented infection. Once again, a nearly zero protection against symptomatic disease and documented infection. We're going to come back to this in a little bit, but just give you uh, add some validity to the research itself. It is from the Department of Ecology and Evolution and Biology, University of California, Santa Cruz. And we'll come back to this study in a, ref in a little bit. What triggered this is interesting as well, because this comes out of Germany. Are you ready? There we go. Let us proceed with this chart. What you're noticing here, what you're witnessing is basically two of the Pfizer vaccines, double vaccinated, otherwise normally traditionally known as fully vaccinated. Fully vaccinated against Moderna. And down here, this is a AstraZeneca vaccine and a Pfizer vaccine combined. What are you noticing here? Zero, zero, zero. And so that's just befuddling. Now, as we proceed a little further, let's make this a little smaller so we can read the highlights down below here. There we go. Let's just do this. There we are. Just so you know, that's what we're looking at. And then look at this. As far as traditional antibody therapy, you normally would think that that red line would be part of your x-axis or this red line would be part of your x-axis no that's the overall effectiveness in the arena of each one of these vaccines zero 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 now boosters they boost up a little bit but nothing compared to where it was prior to the other variants and this is with 95 percent confidence intervals and all experiments were verified. And again, Delta, for those familiar with the color, is gray. Omicron is your red. We are going to come back to these research articles in a bit because first off, right off the bat, I like to get to the positive stuff first. But in reference to Omicron, in the very least, uh, looking at some very, very well-renowned institutions in reference to basically the research where it's coming out of. In reference to Omicron, uh, if you were a policymaker, a bureaucrat, or whatever it comes down to be, uh, the vaccination or mandates of vaccines appear to be nothing but all in vain. Does it mean it saved lives prior? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But however though, to continue with the same policies against a potential inoculation, which normally would have 0% effectiveness, good question. And then top it all off, if two shots yield very little a benefit, let's say right off the bat, you know, if you vaccine like after a month, uh, does that mean a person that's never been vaccinated before do they have to get three shots, like within what, a month, a month and a half? And then on top of that, Omicron. Now this new variant is out and it spreads so fast. What's its particulate size? Does it spread by skin? Does it spread through inhalation, nasal cavity? How does it do it? How is it doing it so fast, especially in these countries, which are very, very heavily vaccinated, which is a little interesting highlight, which we'll come back to in a second here too as well. Um, again, you can read uh, your meaning into it. 
I just want to bring the information to light since it's really not anything that's very, very well known in the media. Uh, but there's a real interesting line here, uh, which I think I find quite intriguing. Now, as a result, this variant is likely to spread much more quickly than Delta, all right, which that we already know, especially in highly immunized populations. As a result, this variant is likely to spread much more quickly than the Delta variant, especially in highly immunized populations. I'll leave you to hypothesize exactly what that means, but let's cover what we're going to cover tonight as well, too. It's going to be intriguing. I mean, I don't know what's, what's going to happen next, but Omicron definitely changed the whole dynamic pretty darn fast. It's going to put a lot of egg on a lot of politicians' faces and bureaucrats as well, which basically um, may have uh, taken the wrong path. But we'll be covering vitamin D dosing, basic principles, and brief alg algorithm. Uh, the llama thing, man, is just incredible. I mean, if we would have – see, that was the thing. If we would have went down, if we would have said, hey, we're creating vaccines against a variant which just surfaced, which is mutating so rapidly that chances are by the time we actually have developed a vaccine, the vaccine may not be effective. Oh, we may find that later on, like receptor binding domains and things like that may be a better thing to vaccinate uh, you know, a, you know, with as opposed to spike proteins, in which they have, but we just, can, we just tend to stick with the same thing over and over again. Uh, we're now we're using a hammer like to cut wood when obviously we should have uh, evolved to using a saw. So I'm not anything against the inoculations. It's just that, you know, with, with all the shadowy stuff in reference to inoculations and FDA not releasing data in reference to the studies and so on and so forth, uh, if there was greater transparency, we probably could have better prepared. It's not my fault, but instead what they do is they censor people that ask the questions and, you know, that's that they have to deal with because obviously we're not the ones at fault. But here we proceed forward. Miniature llama antibodies could help fight SARS-CoV-2 variants. Uh, we'd be looking at bah, 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 the Omicron strain spread in doubling time. Let's get this one out of the way too. This will be a short thing. Omicron, Omicron strain spreads with the doubling time at 3.2 to 3.6 days. Doubling doubling keep that in mind so that's how fast it is spreading i regret the highlight didn't come out here okay but you get the picture so when i show you a chart like let's say like this and for example here's the omicron and then you look at here for example the other countries for example it just had omicron and all of a sudden you see boom thailand's at 100 percent finland's at 100 percent you know, South Africa is at 100%. And you see that massive, that massive spread there. You can understand the exponential growth of Omicron itself. And once it makes a foothold, it appears to be just, thank goodness again, it is, doesn't appear to be anywhere near as severe as the other variants. Uh, but man, it spreads like wildfire. Um, Regardless of the pandemic mitigation factors or lockdown, once it makes a foothold, like, for example, Thailand, boom, it's there. All right, but let's proceed forward. Let me put this back to normal real fast. Let's go look at the other things we're looking at as well, too. Do, do, do. All right, so we got that out of the way. So the right it says in the headline right there, and I'll have all the links for you. Once it surrenders to 4K, you know, I'll do the bookmark thing and everything else for you, so it makes it easier. 3.2 to 3.6 days, doubling time doubling time. That's like sci-fi stuff. All right. Then after that, we look at the mutational cascade of SARS CoV-2. Let's get this one out of the way too. We're just going to all them out of the way. Mutational cascade of SARS CoV-2 2 leading to evolution emergence of the Omicron variant. This is intriguing as well, but it's a one-liner. It just gives you an idea where it's going. Delta and Omicron, you know, basically, have evolutionally diverged in distinct phylo groups and do not share a common ancestry. While Omicron, Omicron shares common ancestry with Lambda, uh, in fact, a variant of inf, uh, interest, and its evolution is mainly derived by the non-synonymous mutations. 
So the interesting part about it is even when they're looking at building a potential uh, antibody response through a third vaccine that's, that's weak but there, um, you know, they're not really – it's – again, it's like trying to use a hammer to cut a piece of wood. It may be much, much more effective just to invent a saw. And, you know, and with all the shadowy stuff that the current uh, – uh, how the current vaccines kind of arose, the FDA lacking advisory committees, um, so on and so forth, some of the whistleblowers reference to some of the other vaccine manufacturers. I would prefer to have um, you know more transparency, if not uh, someone else working uh, working other people, I should say, not the people that have vested psychological or interest in reference to the the growth of inoculation people that can adapt their thinking better uh, and not be afraid to admit when they're wrong about something so we can keep on evolving. So when the new Omicron variant comes out, maybe we could have more mature scientific uh, involvement. You know what I mean? All right, but let's proceed as follows. So that's what it gives. They don't share a common answer. For you. The links will be there for you as well. Um, let's get this one on the way too. Omicron outbreak COVID-19 among vaccinated uh an unvaccinated homeless shelter residents in Sonoma County, California. This is probably one you didn't hear about either. Here we go. All right, let's make this a little bigger so you can see just in case it doesn't res- uh, render 4K. Within a month, 116 residents, 76% received positive SARS-CoV-2 test results, including 66 fully vaccinated residents and 50 not fully vaccinated residents. Non, nine fully vaccinated and one unvaccinated were hospitalized for COVID-19. Yeah, you read it right. Among the shelter residents, 54% were fully vaccinated. 86% of the vaccinated residents had either received Janssen or received an mRNA. But let's go down to the data just so you can see real fast. How does this all turn out? What's this mean? Do, 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 do. I, just, I really, really regret they didn't do more of this you know, on the information networks because it would make life so much easier. But let's look what we're looking at. And here we are. 83, 54% fully vaccinated, 46% not fully vaccinated. 80% infected with SARS, 71% infected with SARS-0, uh, SARS-CoV-2. 56% became symptomatic. 70% became symptomatic. 14% became hospitalized. 2% became hospitalized. Yeah, you're reading it right. So the fully vaccinated, uh, of the fully vaccinated, 80% became infected. 70% became symptomatic. 14% became hospitalized. Of the not fully vaccinated or some unvaccinated, 71% became infected. 56% became symptomatic. And 2% became hospitalized. What do you think? Vaccine mandates? Fire people from their jobs? Create a lot of strife? Threaten to take food out of people's mouths for non-compliance? Again, is it really worth it? Think about that. But that's just to give you an idea. And so, again, the links will be there as well. Uh, and this was just from the Delta variant. And now we're on to Omicron. And I showed you that in reference to Omicron. And so, interesting. And I'll have the links for this as well. And then we'll overcome. Doo, doo, doo. Um, I might as well get this one out of the way as well. SARS CoV 2 Omicron has extensive but incomplete escape from Pfizer. Uh, elicited, elicited neutralization requires ACE2 for infection. But let's go here. Escape was incomplete in participants with higher FR02 due to a previous infection. Previous infection followed by vaccination and boosters likely to increase the neutralization level and likely confer protection from severe disease and Omicron infection. So again, you read it right. Now it appears that the vaccines work really well if, and I will reiterate and watch my wording, if you were infected prior to being vaccinated. Prior to being vaccinated. So if you were infected, and then you became vaccinated. Remember we covered this before? 
you're doing pretty well. But of course, the job of the vaccine was designed to protect you from infection and also disease in transmission. And obviously, we've discovered recently that um, that really is not happening. You know, as far as zero protection against symptomatic disease and documented infection. And so, you know, just depends how often an individual wants to get vaccinated. And again, we'll come back to this a little bit later on too. And then also, well, to do, do. And then just for our data sources, for people know, is our world and data we'll be utilizing. We'll be using VAERS, the CDC. Please read the disclaimer right here. Uh, all reports of CDC, the VAERS CDC site can be, they're not confirmed. They can be uh, information incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, unverifiable, blah, 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 so on and so forth, and subject to biases. No doubt about that. A lot of the information being submitted to VAERS is inaccurate, and I watch a lot of people try to uh, pull data from VAERS which do things which don't eliminate duplicates and not on the side of the CDC here, without a doubt. But however, though, if an argument is going to be postulated to be accurate against why uh, we may have certain failures and policy mitigation strategies, then it has to be done in a realm which deals with facts and not uh, embellishment. You know what I mean? And I hear often you'll have them like mortality rates. And I see these mortality rates, which are much higher than they should be. And I can tell you exactly what they're doing. They're counting duplicate uh, various IDs. And so we're going to cover the base stuff and we're going to we tone it down so we can have a more clear picture and move a less uh, fuzziness. European database, the same thing. That's where we're getting our, var uh, our vaccine reaction information. And of course, GIS aid as far as our variants, so on and so forth, via our world and data. But let's get our first data in to cover real fast. The vitamin D dose is a basic principle and a brief algorithm. The reason I like this uh, particular research more than anything else is because this research here gives a very good hypothesis in re reference to vitamin D recommendations. In the very beginning, when this all came out in Italy and everything else like that, the strongest correlation was vitamin D. And a lot of individuals that were coming real fast, we're not saying a causal relationship, we're just saying correlation because there's so much argument or reference to it. Um, I'd be real curious to see uh, a, uh, a comparison between inoculation and vitamin D uh, therapeutic doses. You know what I mean? Because it's like, I want this argument to end and, you know, reference to it. And if, if one mitigation factor is not effective, then stop and stop. Don't stop pursuing other mitigation factors in case one fails. And what did we do? Uh, we basically focused everything on inoculation, uh, everything on mask, everything on distancing, and all this wonderful research was coming out. And it became, you know, more of a, th a, a people they began to identify with the mitigation events more so than actually moving forward towards whatever. But again, that's we all know that. But that's why I want to do the vitamin D basic dosing principle algorithm. And I will stop talking and move forward. The number of new COVID-19 cases and deaths from COVID-19 are increasing in many countries despite availability of different vaccines, more or less strict lockdowns or other state-level infection control measures and various treatment options. It seems there is a need for other effective tools. You could say that again for combating the COVID-19 disaster. Vitamin D was suggested to be one such tool and it was a long time ago. It is well known that vitamin D in the form of calcitriol uh, has a, a pleiotropic activity in human organism, da da da. In the previous year, the main mechanisms of vitamin D action in regard to COVID 19 infection were already discussed, and some suggestions for vitamin D dosing in COVID 19 were proposed. Recently, it was suggested that vitamin D might act as an important cofactor of strengthening the, the activity of COVID 19 vaccines. Yeah. All right, but however, though, the researchers here did a wonderful job breaking down therapeutic and prophylactic doses for maintenance and so on and so forth. And you're going to find the dosing to be, especially here in the United States, uh, to be quite surprising. Are you ready? Let's proceed. The risk factors for low vitamin D status. And I'll have the link here as well, just so you can pull it up on your own. Uh, again, references are vitally important. Remember when one of us went to school, we had to footnote all the data we had. If you didn't have footnotes, the teacher handed it back to you. Here we go. These are the risk factors. 
a lot of risk factors across the board. And again, I'm doing this so you could see it and you could link it on your own, like chronic fatigue syndrome, hypertension, uh, insufficient magnesium intake. Remember, magnesium is required to make the activity of vitamin D. And so if you see yourself on this chart, you know, it's not a bad idea to, uh, to find out what your vitamin D status is. Now, I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but here is basically the levels, the nanomoles. So if you got a blood test done and you, you could look at this as far as the range, and the range is between 100 and 150 nanomoles, right? So now you have like a, the data to work with. And a lot of medical professionals, all be, are brilliant individuals, that mean, this may not be their field of expertise. That's why I want to bring you reference to this research. All right, prophylactic doses daily. Here we are. Look at the dose. Now, normally I would think, wow, that would be high for an infant. But again, this is what they're recommending. Six, this is prophylactic, six to 12 months, one to 10 years of age, 800 to I to 200, 2000 IUs a day for teens, 11 to 18. You know, same range for 18 to 75. So once you're there, and then adults, 75 or older, not that the adults are enough between 18 and 75. So I, I, I missed the word in there. Uh, 2000 to 4000. And intermittent dosing every once in a while, I guess just to boost those levels, 25,000 I use if every two to one weeks, four to five to two weeks, so on and so forth, and down the line. Upper tolerable limits, right there. Therapeutic dosing. For example, someone that's extremely low and need to build it up. Here we are. 1,000 I use a day, three months, 2,000. And this is a recommendation of the researchers. It's not me. I'm just reading the research directly. So just keep in mind. Children 1 to 11, you know, heard all the information. So something you could bring into your medical professional and basically uh, review. Uh, and also, too, it gives you a good standing where you are with vitamin D. Vitamin D plays a huge role, and not just in necessarily anything with coronaviruses, but so many different things. So again, this information that the researchers weeded out for us to find is just wonderful. Conclusions. Due to various risk factors, many COVID-19 and other patients at high risk develop low vitamin D status. If possible, it's reason reasonable to check their serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels, and only after that an appropriate dose of vitamin D supplement should be suggested. So what he's saying is get tested, vitamin D tested, find out your status, and from there you have a benchmark in which to work. In case 25 hydroxy vitamin D measurements are not available, take moderate vitamin D doses at, at least 4,000 I use a day. Could be advised for at least one to one and a half months. Presuming that this supplementation can contribute to reaching adequate vitamin D status and can help maintain better overall health status, both skeletal and non-skeletal. Until serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D testing will be accessible for the current patient. If low vitamin D status is confirmed, an appropriate large enough vitamin D dose must be suggested for supplementation and the next check of serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels should be advised after the treatment in order to evaluate treatment results and choose the right tactic regarding further supplementation. Beautiful, beautiful research article. It gives you the benchmark and the tools in order to work and research on your own and also to something to bring in as well with your medical professional or medical partner, I should say, in order to discuss, especially in this ever-changing field of immunology or vaccinology, whatever you want to call it. All right, but otherwise, it's really cool that, that this, I wanted to bring this to your attention because, again, it's just nice to have the information to have on hand. To proceed as follows, llamas. Llamas have been in the forefront, people don't realize it, since the very beginning. And they're just so freaking cool. Well, let's, recent, let's read through the research real fast. Miniature llama antibodies could help SARS-CoV-2 variants. And the reason why is quite interesting. So let's proceed down. All right. The researchers hope that nanobody combination can be developed into a COVID treatment that is effective against both current and future variants. The human antibody is a chunky form. This is why. Human antibodies, a chunky formation of two protein chains, but llamas, camels, and other species of the camel day family make antibodies consisting of only one protein. So it's smaller, which makes it inch more easier to work with. It goes basically follows. The small size of nanobodies allows them to access hard to reach spots. It sounds so mechanistic, but there it is. 
uh, on the SARS-CoV-2 virus than larger antibodies. Yeah, this is like so. It's like so. You go like a, a difference between a tennis ball and a beach ball. The larger antibodies may be unable to access. So here you're trying to get the beach ball into the basketball hoop. Let's put it that way. And you know it's being blocked because it's a beach ball. And that did you throw a tennis ball in there? You got it made. It also allows researchers to combine nanobodies capable of hitting different parts of the virus, minimizing its chances of escape. One of the most amazing things that we observed with an antibody is that they show extraordinary synergy. The combined effect is much greater than the sum of its parts. The researchers next plan to test the safety and efficacy of the antibodies in animal studies. I just like the, I want them to speed this along. So many studies have been gravitating towards the llamas, and it's just intriguing. It says, besides being small and nimble, they are also inexpensive to mass produce in yeast or bacteria. This is probably one of the main reasons why I want some of the major players out of pandemic mitigation and more in interesting to the in information as far as research and scientists that have less uh, financial incentive uh, because inexpensive mass produce and in yeast, more of they are remarkably stable. The ability to these molecules to withstand high temperatures and long storage times means they could be developed into a drug accessible in various settings worldwide. This should have been done a long time ago. Now, if we were honest in reference to inoculation and basically, or variolation, I want to say, if you want to go back to the 1700s, uh, you know, with the modicum of, of financial investment, you can yield tremendous benefit overall. And that would have been incredible. Uh, but again, to proceed as far as there's we're looking at. All right, then we covered disinformation as follows. We've covered the, the strains. Uh, we know the spread time as far as exponential growth, potentially higher in Im highly immunized countries. Again, you can read your own meaning into that, as we read prior. Uh, the cascade effect, that basically Omicron is not very similar to Delta. Very interesting. Uh, and basically the Delta, uh, the results of current vac vaccination in a real world setting uh, in homeless shelters. Now it says comorbidities and things like that could add to confounding, but regardless, um, data is data. And there's your observation. Uh, you can re rash, that here's the most dangerous part. Is we rationalize our way out of what we see. And we start saying, well, it's comorbidities, there's this, that, this. The bottom line is the outcome was not the desired outcome in reference to inoculation because those which were inoculated uh, fully did not seem to fare as well. And of course, we could read our own meaning to that. The SARS Omicron uh, infection here, which we read before, to the neutralization effect, and so on and so forth. And let us go now to the other research articles, the big ones. Here we go. Again, I just. I would like to do positive things because, again, it's one thing is fear mongering and so on and so forth, but, you know, and also developing decent situational awareness. That's why I do the vitamin D and llama stuff and everything else like that. Uh, because there are options out there. People can take control or medical professionals can help. But here we are. This information we received, we got out of here. Reduced neutralization of SARS CoV 2 Omicron variant by vaccine serum monoclonal antibodies. All right, now again. The whole thing, which was the first article that came out, that basically said, hey, Houston, we have a problem. And it was, the weird part about it is many of you heard, oh, you need a booster, you need this, you need that, and so on and so forth. And then you started hearing, well, to be fully vaccinated, you need three shots. Um, well, what does fully vaccinated mean? I mean, honestly, what does that mean as far as immunological uh, standpoints? Uh, are you continuing to use a leaky vaccine strategy, which is going to help increase viral, uh, uh, how would say, viral fitness? You know what I mean? Let's see if I scroll down here. Yeah, this was pretty much it for this particular study itself. And I'll have it linked. But think about all the individuals that were compliant and did everything right and played by all the rules. And now here comes Omicron. And there we are. And... You know, the media should have picked up on this two weeks ago. I shouldn't be doing this uh, by far, but there, there it is. And that's why I do the videos because so much gets missed. 
So there we have big zeros on the double vaccination. A little bit of a, a boost there in reference to basically um, when a booster uh, shot and or people that were prior, infected prior. But you're going to start seeing you know, the recommendations every four to six months if they continue down this path, which just means most likely you know, anything can happen, especially increasing viral fitness. Uh, estimate to reduce vaccine effectiveness. We'll read through here once again. Uh, again, it's building on the prior research from here. We'll look at blah, blah, blah. Overall, these analysis indicate that vaccine effectiveness against severe disease is significantly diminished for weighing individuals. Why is he doing that? And protection against infection, symptomatic disease and transmission and transmission is nearly eliminated. So overall, the vaccine effectiveness against severe disease is significantly diminished for waned individuals and protection against infection, symptomatic disease, and transmission is nearly eliminated. However, third dose significantly ameliorates these reductions but only restore protection to levels equivalent to waned protection against the Delta variant. That's the best you're going to get. At, uh, I think it was 58% or something like that. It wasn't, uh, according to other studies, it was not, not nothing dramatic. And as we scroll down, there's the data as far as they have, as far as with Delta. And then you know, all the research that they did, lots of pictures. And as we scroll, in contrast, neutral, we read this before, 324 lower. Uh, putting them, you are, a lot of you heard 40. Remember, you hear this number a lot. But they didn't tell you this number, did they? They only told you this number. And... This number would only make a difference if it was within a short period of time and the booster was there and so on and so forth. But people that started getting vaccinated at the very beginning, um, you know, that jumped in right off the bat, three, you know, greater than four months ago, not that long ago, 324 lower than recent vaccines against the wild type, putting them outside the range of our data. The data is so low, it's not within the range, and indicating very substantial reductions in vaccine effectiveness for hospitalization. And once again, nearly zero protection against symptomatic disease and documented infection. And you get your third booster and you can get a little bit of a boost, but not exactly that dramatic now, is it? All right, let's get proceed forward. Bop, bop, bop. The Omicron variant, the SARS-CoV-2, has grown rapidly in many countries. We have shown that approximately 40-fold reduction in re neutralizing antibody teeters, we heard before, Greatly erodes vaccine protection, increases the relative risk of infection and symptomatic disease more than fourfold and hospitalization twofold. As a result, this variant is likely to spread, again, the wording is real careful here, much more quickly than Delta, especially in highly immunized populations. Why? Could it have to do with prior infection? Could it do with the vaccine waning past four months? Um, again, a lot of hypothesis and a lot of conjecture. All right, and then we proceed to here. This study right here is basically clinical and genomic signatures arising SARS-CoV-2 Delta breakthrough infections in New York. What do we have? Delta breakthroughs increase significantly with time since vaccination and after adjusting for co-founders that rose at similar rates as in unvaccinated individuals. Rose at similar rates as in unvaccinated individuals. See, it's really weird. If you look at vaccine effectiveness, it really depends on the, the time frame or the window of time when you're talking. So you're talking recently, or you're talking beginning. In the beginning, D614G, was it? Uh, does it even exist anymore? What happened? And now we're talking Omicron. And so, yeah, that's what happens when you develop a, a vaccine against something which is fairly new to the environment that hasn't finished mutating yet or stabilized. But here we go. Ba -ba -ba. Down the line, down the line, down the line. Do, 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 I mean, what do I know? And let's see. Do, 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 do. Here we go. Since emergency use authorization of the first COVID-19 vaccine in December 2020, the spotlight has been on viral sequences from vaccinated individuals to closely monitor the potential emergence in what is this emergence? Escape mutations. The vein, the vein, the vein. Well, you got to find a vein for vaccine, but the vein of leaky vaccines. And I'll let you look up what a leaky vaccine is. But here we go. Because again, I don't want, I want to make sure our wording is such a way 
that we're not the ones that get censored. And I think we go down the line. Our data suggests that the selective adaptation process might be in process. Our data suggests that the selective adaptation process might be in process. I know it sounds kind of wordy, does it? They may eventually lead to, oh great, hang on a second, eventually lead to the accumulation of mutations or new subvariants under vaccine immune pressure. Again, I'll let you understand or to find out what that means. Uh, but yeah, keep on doing what's not quite working all the way and, and um, yeah, see how that works out for you all. Not you all as far as those that actually watch these videos, which I'm always grateful you do, but you know, the you all, the you all that basically has uh, pinned their identity um, to basically certain scientific aspects, uh, which are not adaptable. All right, let's proceed. All right, now let's get into right to the research as follows. And move me over here. Ba, ba, ba. There I am. All right, let's go over to the first thing of interest. Let's go to our basic Omicron. Now, Omicron, for example, let's go give you an idea what we have here. So Omicron first began to develop right about here. So there's our Omicron. South Africa, and that was, look at the date, November 15, 2021. Hong Kong, Botswana. Do we have Omicron here at all? Let me see. Nope, no Omicron. All right, then all of a sudden, boom. And actually, Omicron may have been in the background. They said as early as October, just that they weren't really yet, you know, testing for it. And some people said it's even been around for over a year and a half, and it just eventually basically had an opportunity to grow. They don't know why, but it did. Grow, spread, grow. All right, here it goes. Now, November 29th, let's see what happens. Omicron, bum, bum, bum. South Africa, 100%. South Korea, sorry, South Korea. Wasn't even detected. There was, look at this. Check this out. South Korea, right here, 100% Delta. South Korea, 100% Delta on November 1st. All of a sudden, boom, November 29th. Total, complete viral pathogen replacement. Total, I mean, from, an, from, from, a, from uh, a contagion aspect, it is just jaw-dropping. So between... Here in South Korea, there's Delta, ba ba ba. Then all of a sudden, boom, here comes Omicron. It's caught people off guard. That's why there's so little research this past week because the heads are spinning. They don't know what to think. And then all of right here, boom, this is as of November 10th. Thank you to GIS Aid uh, and Our World and Data for the data sent to which I can scrape. Here's Australia, Belgium, Canada, Finland. 100%. Netherlands, 92.86. Uh, Norway, 48% of the sequences. Uh, South Africa, 100% still. Uh, South Korea, we went through 100%. Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, Thailand, United Kingdom, and the United States. So the next week's video is going to be real interesting in reference to the variant spread. Let's get the mutations out of the way. Let's make sure if anything we covered here. Ba, ba, ba. All right. Here's the Belgium anomaly. Remember last week, uh, as far as what happened to Belgium, they started vaccinating like crazy. Ba -ba 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 and then all of a sudden, there it is, uh, as far as basically cases per million. Look at that Look at that growth. It's, a, it's incredible. Look right here. Uh, Singapore. Now, let's look at a drop all of a sudden. But look at that as far as with the vaccination. Remember, the purple is the vaccination. You see what I mean? And then new cases per, per million. And then we go back up. We're working kind of backwards here, so I have to apologize. The positivity rate. Look at that. The positivity rate is, is not going down. The vaccination is way up there. Look at Singapore. Now, they readjusted down below to nine, you know, to 85.8, or what is it, 87 out of 100 people fully vaccinated. That mitigation factor is not working. It's, you know, or the lockdowns or the distancing or the mat. It's not looking like it's working. Now, let's put it that way from an observational data standpoint. Uh, here we are, uh, Belgium, uh, mortality per million. There we are as far as the vaccination aspect. Uh, and then, thank goodness, because I don't like to, I don't like to, I don't like to see high death rates. 
and then look as it goes up and then also it drops down as far as deaths per million bounces back up goes back down again for Singapore and then we go down here fully vaccinated per 100 right there this is kind of tough to read I apologize it's kind of small United Arab Emirates, United Arab Emirates, Emirates, Portugal, Singapore, Chile. Those are your vaccine leaders. Singapore was the most vaccinated, but they had a readjustment in the figure now at 87 per 100. I don't know where they can, that came from. Let's look at the reproduction rate. Ready? Here we go. Do you see any difference? This all leading the same line as far as basically vaccines and viruses spreading. Total boosters, did they make a difference? Check it out. Now with reproduction rates, uh, China is just going to town on boosters. Positivity rate, let's see what happens. Positivity rate? Eh, looks about eh, so much. Now let's look at the other data. There's our basically our vaccine amounts. They were just with the figure somehow. Now this is how I find the data up. Oh, we just lost a web jail. Let's see right here. I was gonna show you that, but then just that I guess we have something running in the background. Let's carefully keep vaccinated per million, da 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 da, da cases per million. Yeah, you know, this is right here. Let's make this a little smaller. So we can get it all into the same light. It may jump a little bit, but let's see if it does. All right. Now, interesting part right here. Look at what we have as far as, you see right there? This is 0 to 10, it's fully vaccinated per 100. And uh, I don't know what's running in the background, slowing this down, but hopefully you, you can see the countries as they come up. And look at 81 per 100 right here. There we are. Is basically fully vaccinated per 100. Do you see any difference? I don't get it. Ghana and Kenya. Uh, in reference to any, any trend that could show you that mass vaccination is making a difference. Deaths per million. Bah, 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 down the line. You see right there, looking for some sort of causal, not even a causal, just give me a strong correlation. All right, because again, these, let's just use these because there's more countries. Uh, this is such a small sampling right now. It's tough to basically, you know, even gauge into the data. Because look at this, case is smooth per million, 1.48. And those little, ah, I won't even pop up. But at least here, 17.32 in case per million in the countries which are very, vaccinated reproduction rates you see right down the line let's see we got a web gl back real fast nope i don't know what happened there all right but otherwise outside of that that just gives you a real interesting idea any other further data we got check this out correlation the correlation between total cases per million and people fully vaccinated per 100 you can read into that what you want to uh you know there could be tons of confounding to that but regardless of that 0.938 if you don't know what correlation is uh, find out the threshold where correlation may imply causality and then come back to this video and look at 0.938 and that just gives you an idea all right let's go into do, 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 do. let's check out how Florida and look we'll at this out of the way real fast too before we go to the vaccine versus reporting system and also as well as um, uh, the European database so let's look at this real fast and give it a second. We have some background, obviously something running. There we are. And oh, we've almost passed it. New cases 100, uh, per 100,000 smooth. Are you ready? One week. Here we are. Florida. Let's make this a little bigger again. I'm going to bounce a little bit, so please bear with me. Now it's, yeah, there we are. So there we are. Florida. Now that's a lot of bouncing. Stop. There. Cases moved for 100,000. California. You see right there. New York. And Texas. Remember when Texas was way up there? Let's go to year to date. And they said like Texas is going to fall apart. Remember Florida, the Neanderthal statements. No vaccine mandates. No distancing. Or I'm not aware of. Uh, no lockdowns. And Florida is just way ahead of the pack and now texas is ahead of new york and new york is just going maniacal on its controls vaccine mandates this that so on and so forth i'm into observation and yeah in a lab setting in a controlled setting you may be able to make a very solid argument for certain pandemic mitigation uh strategies 
But in a real world setting, uh, there's something, there's some confound, there has to be confounding taking place. There has to be. This is year to date. And because it's just not, this is four weeks. It's just not showing their strategies. They're creating more collateral damage than it appears to be at this point in time. Uh, let's look at the, uh, for example, new death smooth for 100,000. Uh, let's, this is the entire year. Let's see how Florida and Texas are cons they're doing. Look at this, Florida, New Texas is about the same as New York, a little higher, I'd say, what do you say, 1.44, 1.36 for New York is mortality per 100,000, uh, 1.29 for California, and then Florida, 0 0.093. So you can have your freedom in your life at the same time. All right, and let's go up to the top real fast. Uh, overall, for whatever reason, mortality is about the same as it was in the beginning, so I'm not impressed by treatments. Uh, let's go down, da, 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 go to the top, and let's see. Do, 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 do. This is going to give us the average age of mortality. There we are, average age of mortality. Every child's life is valuable, and we're going to get back into that in a second. We're going to do, we're draw some comparisons, so focus on this chart. Uh, so that's what we have. The average age of mortality is still way up there, uh, 75 years or older, and which could be lead to confounding because a lot of places may have low mortality because how I don't make it sound crass, but I don't know how else to word it. If life expectancy is not long enough to succumb to COVID, then the mortality is going to be lower. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? If, they don't, if the average life expectancy is below 75, and the average mortality rate of COVID is 75, then then they may not be living long enough to uh, succumb to COVID, if that makes any sense. But there's your mortality figures by age. All right, let's look at uh, web scraping data in reference to basically the um, the vaccine information. All right, what this information is here. For those not familiar, there is a VAERS file, and we cover this each time. As we get past here, there are zip files. And the zip files, for example, right here. See right there? All right. See, so at 163.34 megabytes, that's all the vaccine adverse event reports submitted to VAERS for 2021 so far. Compare to 2020, which is 11.32, 2019, 11.22, 20. So you see where a lot of the, the hesitation begins to arise. When you have that many reactions being submitted to VAERS coming in so fast that a lot of healthcare workers, when they review the data, you know, a lot of them want their job and they want to keep on working and feed their families. And so if there's a vaccine mandate, you know, they're going to comply. But that's that seems horrible way to motivate people. And so there we are. That is the zip file size, which we showed you. See 163.34, and then we look at 163.34. So graphically, that's how it looks, all right? This is as far as from a bar chart aspect, file size comparison, we are looking at uh, 163.34 megabytes. So it is actually compared to 122 for the three decades combined, all the reports. File size difference compared to 30 years, it is now 40 megabytes larger. And this is just the short-term immediate effects uh, compared to prior 30 years. Um, the file size for 2021 so far is 33% larger than 30 years combined. And of course, here is each year. If we're looking at that. And yeah, we'll go past that. And now let's go to our various database. Again, remember the disclaimer. Let's go to our rebuild first because I want to give you a little bit of information as far as how things are changing into the data itself. All right, no, I take that back. Let's go into the various data set itself. It may take a second to click on over, but let's give it a second. And what we're going to notice is certain trends. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the dynamic. I'm going to start changing the dynamic looking for basically reactions, which are which are long range. And 
don't have to worry about this. This way I have something else set up in a second. Hang on one second. Give this a second. And there we go. Let me just pause it. There we are. All right, these are the... Great. All right, I'm going to go to the top, I guess. All right, let's see what we got here. All right, we're looking, looking, looking. This is our 2021 file size uh, of all of adverse event reports. So you have 710,581 adverse event reports submitted to VAERS just for 2020, 2021 so far. All right, and then we go up. Da, 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 uh, 9,120 deaths reported to VAERS. Remember, reported to VAERS means not confirmed, means verification. And then 710,581 adverse events reported to VAERS. Let's scroll down here, see if there's any little more information. We're going to go past our word clouds here. All right, and then we are going to go past that too. We're going to refine the data a little bit better uh, this time moves forward. And also, too, for the data researchers out there, there's a mixed data type in the, uh, the VAERS data, and I'll show you where that is in a second. These are the uh, vaccine adverse event reports being submitted to VAERS. The most common one is obviously fatigue. Uh, and there, here's our average age per condition, myocarditis, shoulder injuries, hypersomnia, fatigue, mortality. And these are the reports being submitted to VAERS. Obviously, fatigue is number one. And these are the most common. And then as time moves forward for expediency and time, uh, you, you see a lot of like product administered to patients of inappropriate age, which means probably a child, uh, and so on and so forth. So a lot of new things rising, but I'm gonna try to find the velocity so I can find out exactly if anything new starts arising because of the, the time. Because a lot of people have now have been vaccinated for over a year and we can start seeing if there's any long-term uh, issues. Uh, blah, 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 skin burning sensation, so on and so forth. All right, let's go to the rebuild. Here we go. There we are. Give it a second. I don't know why it's running so slow in the background. All right, so here we are. For the data analysts out there that utilize the CDC information from VAERS, there's a mixed data type in birth defect. And so they have floats mixed in with strings, which really slows things down. If you change the column to string, you'll speed it up immensely. All right, and so here we go. What are we looking at? These are individuals that succumb. This is why I'm talking about speeding up, so you can see how to review the data. These individuals that have succumbed to die the day of the shot. Doesn't mean they died because of the shot. They can be background information. But we have 1,510 reports where they were inoculated and passed away. These are the average age groups, as you can see. And you said, I don't know why there's so many zeros. I want to find out more about that a little bit later on. But as you go down here and you begin to look at the ages as you go down, and you can see the major symptoms prior to uh, uh, passing away, you know, you start seeing real interesting data begin to pop up. How this occurs, whether it's through, you know, some sort of uh, other issue related to, related to that, um, it's interesting. So I'm going to break that down and trying to find out how some of the youth uh, blood pressure are measurable. Yeah, you find a lot of weird symptoms reported in re reference to them passing away. And it's really kind of sad because as you do it this way, each one of these dots represents a person and what they basically and how they've succumbed with the symptoms they succumb to in reference to um, inoculation. And it's 1,510, all right? And so if you, people are familiar with box plots here, you can get here and these are all the outliers, obviously, um, which I don't know if it's from breastfeeding or what, uh, but that's unusual. I'd like to be able to figure out more, find out more without adding any conjecture, all right? The reports to VAERS, again, 9,417 here, uh, two VAERS. So a like, little difference in the numbers there. Um, these are, the, again, the people that had succumbed. purported wise it doesn't have to be like road traffic accident. You know, I don't know how that applied to basically see why I see these vaccine reports need to be validated. Um, but a lot of them, you know, you don't know. But as you go into lower and lower age groups, 
Um, that's horrible. See, we hear about the news. This person it was the age of 13 years of age. They were administered a vaccine at the inappropriate age, and they succumb. Uh, you know, as you go lower and lower, and you see these younger ages, and then you just go back to basically vaccine effectiveness against Omicron uh, to be something like zero, you begin to start looking at is the risk to benefit ratio there, uh, especially in this new this new event, uh, new variant. And then we go down and I start breaking up the age here. All right, these are the individuals right here. Now I can make this a little bit bigger. Let me bounce, let's see what we do. Uh, give it a second. These are the individuals 17 and younger. So 193 supposedly had reports to bears that had succumbed somehow in relation potentially correlation with the vaccine. And I'm not trying to say causal. And these are how many youth 17 and younger that died of COVID reported to the CDC. Also requires ver verification and validity as well. So I don't like seeing that. That ratio is 3.34 to one. Uh, again, it's running risk benefit analysis. And the reason I don't like seeing this is because a lot of the mortality here in the CDC, there's no way for me to break it down in a time, uh, in a time frame yet. Like how many died in the 2020 from, uh, from SARS or January and February and so on and so forth. So all it has is totals. Uh, but the vaccine want to do, I can break it down time-wise. So you can see, for example, here we are. These are all the mortality under the age of 17. And you see spikes. Maybe that's going back to school, or whatever it is. Uh, mortality all the way up to here. And these are the individuals that supposedly uh, had reports submitted to VAERS. Again, I'm watching my wording very carefully. Uh, in relationship to mortality and vaccination. So you take it for what it's worth. All right, you can run your own data analysis as well. Uh, and, you know, and start making your own basically conclusion. 193 here. So what, what did I come here? 171? So it didn't quite go all the way. I don't know why the date may have come off with December 1st. But we'll get that adjusted. Uh, and But still, it's just, I don't like that ratio. I, I apologize. 3.34 to 1. I just, I don't like it. All right, now serious reactions from uh, Dura Vigilance. Remember, Dura Vigilance has the exact same disclaimer as basically, uh, you know, VAERS. 12,366 fatal designations to Dura Vigilance. I want to go through that information a bit more because that seems a little, it, it bounces around and it seems a little low to me. Now I'm going to go to the rebuild just to see what we have. All right, most common reactions. The 710,146 reactions, which are very close to the reactions submitted to VARES overall here in the United States, but serious reactions. Serious reactions are ones that require medical care or medical attention to endure vigilance in the European Union as of December 11th. Main thing is headache, heroxia, fatigue, myalgia, chills, uh, abdominal pain, mental disorders, uh, cough, so on and so forth. Uh, for example, like here, uh, can be here, you know, it can be relationships with each other. So it's some, some sort of uh, uh, relationship, vaccine failure. That's going to grow quite a bit with Omicron. Um, but yeah, down the line. And so here we are. Uh, vaccine reports serious and, and not so serious. 1,254,026 reported to the Vigilance system as of December 11th. And then we pass over this. Yeah, we did. Uh, whoop, you know what I'm not showing here? I'm not showing the total, but I can do that later on. So seven, you get the information there. 710,146 serious reactions submitted to the Endure Vigilance System. 700,146 reactions that required medical care. And that, I think, is it, my friends. So let's review what we reviewed real fast. So did we finish early. All right, getting the data sources for those that need to know. And we'll start with the friendly stuff first and get to the more questionable stuff at the end. 
We covered vitamin D dosing. Link will be there for you to follow. Work with your medical professional. Really enlightening. Llamas, all I'm just trying to do is make sure the research doesn't fade into obscurity. Because llamas, is, there's something there. Just Every time you read about the llama research, it's just incredible. And once they get those nanobodies, very inexpensive. Help the entire world out in a way that is not so intrusive, potentially, to people's freedom of self-autonomy and determination. Australia. Uh, then the Omicron strain, the doubling time. Once it's there, I would love to know the, uh, the particulate size required for transmission. Uh, whether this is for my transmission, meaning it's on, on objects or whatever it is. Uh, but wow, that is just, I mean, literally going from zero to 100% within 30 days, total viral pathogen replacement. That is a contagion model. I'd love to be able to see uh, a, a far better data analyst than me manufacture. Because that means worldwide growth uh, within an incredibly short period of time coverage. All right, then after that, basically just information on the cascade on their distant, 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 distant cousins per se, but Delta and Omicron have evolutionary diverged in distinct phylo groups. So that's gonna be real interesting as far as, you know, them trying to tweak a vaccine. Like you hear them say, oh, we can tweak the vaccine uh, with the Omicron variant. Uh, well, yeah, if it was that similar, that'd be interesting, but no. All right, after that, um, the Delta variant, again, um, uh, you know, all best laid plans, not so good. Again, I read a lot of information here. This was, again, California research. Um, you know, uh, it's not about, you know, well, maybe, maybe one less person caught it. You know, it's all worth all the lockdowns and schools being closed and people having – miserable times going outside or or if you're like me and you're out and you're, you're California and we still have our mask mandates and you, you drive 10 miles and you realize from home you left your your face mask at home and then you can't go to the bank for whatever reason you know no it's not I'm not going to live in some other person's maniacal reality uh, because of their self-induced paranoia science is science observation is observation and there it is. That didn't, at least in that one case, no. Uh, then after that, uh, Omicron extends an incomplete escape. We knew that already. Uh, and yeah, if you were already infected and then you were vaccinated, you win. But then why would you ever need the vaccination if you were already infected? All right, outside of that, then basically go to our other research. Bah, bah, bah. I'm not here to explain things. I'm just here to ask questions. All right, so there we are. As far as you can't get much more subjective than that. Zero. Yeah, go ahead. Keep on doing this. And then all the things we learned about with viral pathogen replacement and viral fitness and all this other stuff, uh, those aren't made up things by immunology and epidemiologists. Those are actually really, 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 really real world scenarios that can help them. Because you, it's like, for example, the bacteria, you kill 99.9% .9 of it. Well, imagine if you're only killing, there's your 58% with the booster right there. What, what if you're only killing 58% of it? You're like bringing everyone to the gym, viral pathogen wise. And then it's down to 25%. I know this is really, it's really deceiving the way you see this. And after three months. So what are you going to do? You get a vac vaccine just to maintain a 58%, what, you're going to get vaccinated every single week? You know? And then what about the opportunity for, were the vaccine studied to be that vaccinated that often? And then the antibodies? Well, bring in the llamas. You know, it's like, seriously, stop trying to use a hammer to cut a two by four. And then basically we go to here, bum, bum, bum. so we cover that research. And then... You read into it what you want to. The research is being validated in multiple avenues, uh, especially in, as a result, the variant is likely to spread much more quickly than the Delta variant, or that we've seen, especially in highly immunized populations. So maybe that's why the vaccine, it, the Omicron is just jumping into these countries and just becoming 100% so rapidly. 
uh, of uh, all of the variants. Uh, very good research, again, just to reiterate and have links. Um, this is from, from the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, the University of California, Santa Cruz. And, um, you know, third dose, remember the third dose, 58%. And, uh, and then this one, of course, was from Germany and a few other uh, multitudes of institutions. Because that was big news. When you, when you say 0%, you want confirmation it's 0%. Because otherwise, in this maniacal world of control and, and canceling people, which if you don't like the research or the science because it, you know, it doesn't meld with some of the policy maker, uh, yeah, you want as many people on your, uh, backing you up as possible. And then, of course, last one, da 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 and this one was basically the Delta breakthrough and the unvaccinated and the potential, to, as we just said before, building um, vac uh, vaccine escape mutations emergence. Once again, warning number 2,222,344. Again, gratitude. We actually finished a little earlier than before. The links will be there once we get 4K set so you can go straight to it. Otherwise, uh, the upcoming weeks going to be really, really, really interesting. As you're going to have a a, um, a, a head-on collision between mandates in reference to pandemic mitigation strategies and people losing their jobs and a lot of politicians that really, really, really put their entire reputation on line forcing the people to get vaccinated uh, with an iron fist. And vaccine efficacy, which has been brought into tremendous, tremendous question, as well as social media platforms, which now have to find a way to back away slowly, let freedom of information spread, and not say because someone says something may not be effective, doesn't mean that they're anti-science. It can mean actually they are very, very, very much science. All right. Guys, catch y'all later on. It is now 11.47. I actually got done before the 12th of December, so it's actually kind of cool. And again, I have it all rendered ready for you. And thank you very much for watching. And next week is going to be real, real, real intriguing because Omicron just put a massive wild card into the entire event. And now every week can come to the end of the year. It's going to be really, really interesting. Watch a lot of bureaucrats cling to their Justinian plague strategy uh, as opposed to come to fruition knowledge-wise and adapt to a changing field. And the field has changed. So we'll see. All right, y'all. Catch you later on and see you next time. Bye.